uh, this panel number three today, translating what and how, uh, sort of what's in your toolbox. So uh, I'm going to introduce the speakers. They'll, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll give us their 10 minutes remarks, and then we'll have a, a, a lot of exchange between the four of them, and also with questions from you. We'll have, a, we'll have them in, uh, in a good conversation. So uh, Betsy Knapper uh, is a scholar, teacher, translator, and activist, having founded and led the Tibetan Nuns Project for decades. She engages with texts as different as Gelug logic and Nyingma liturgy, working with American undergraduates and striving young Tibetan scholars, and is here to talk with us about the requirements, oh, sorry, here with us to, um, to talk about the requirement to ask different questions and take different approaches in translating these diverse genres for diverse audiences. Uh, Tipton Jimpa of McGill University and the Institute of Tibetan Classics is renowned for his translation work and his oral interpreting. He has published on ethics, grammar, philosophy, and other topics. He is one of those scholars who, when they start speaking, you just want to sit and listen and hope that he continues for a long time, <laughs> which puts me in an awkward spot. Um, <laughs> Jimpa is, of course, an L2 translator, translating from his mother tongue into a learned language and has a different perspective than most of our speakers. Curtis Schaefer, uh, the chair of the religion department at the University of Virginia, has given us books and articles on a wide range of topics. He's translated the autobiography of a 17th century nun, co-authored and co-edited many collections of essays and translations, and of course did us all the great favor by gathering and publishing many of Jean's essays. Uh, he's chosen to work on poetry lately and will present some of his insights today. Janet Gatso, uh, not only is Janet a professor of religion at Harvard and a newly elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, she is also one of the most creative uh, thinkers in Tibetan and Buddhist studies and one of the most generous and kind teachers. She spent a semester at Michigan while I was doing my degree. We read the most interesting Tibetan texts and several indecipherable works of French philosophy, <laughs> all of which produce rousing conversations and continual inquiry. I look forward to her remarks and how she personally approaches translation with the same sense of generosity and curiosity. So, Betsy. So, I have been elected to start because on the grounds that my talk would be the most practical. <laughs> and and this, is, this is me. I'm not a theory person, I'm not a systems person, but I've kind of always done things just by practicality, and then I understand the theory later, in a sense. So, I'm going to give a bit of a historical context because I was at the 2008 conference that was organized by Jules Levinson and Jesse Friedman. And we went around the room on how many years have people been translating. And we get up there to the 40 year category, which <laughs> I now fall into as well. And the point was made that when we all started, there were two books out there was T.R.V. Murti on Madhyamaka, and there was Shcherbatsky on Buddhist logic. And that was it. <laughs> and, and those were the days where the, there were three people, kind of known teachers of Tibetan Buddhist things. There was Trungpa Rinpoche, there was Tartan Toku, and Geshe Wangyal had his center in New Jersey. And I studied there in the early years. And the first book I ever worked on was Geshe Wangyal's book, The Door of Liberation. And I was brand new. I actually learned my Tibetan working on that book. And my function was really to write things down well, Josh and Debbie argued about literal or pretty. You know, so we were right in that argument from day one. And, um, and then I, after that, I went through the Virginia program, which anchored me more on the somewhat literal side of things. And then I kind of quit all that for a period of a number of years and went off to India working with the Tibetan Nuns Project, motivated largely because I understood that as a woman in this country and even going over to Asia to do research, I was given the honorary guy pass and had access that none of the Tibetan women had. It was, there, was, there weren't studies in the nunneries. Lay, women, lay people in general weren't studying much. So that wasn't a gender thing. That was just the nature of the universe. So I kind of stepped out of the field for 15 years and came back. And like suddenly, it's, it's almost like there's a canon. You know, there's, all, there's Jimba's project. There's the Tibetan classics. There's all of the Tadra books. There's all of the Nyingma texts that have been coming out. Um, and it feels like a canon in a way, but it's great when you have a talk like Jan's this morning and you realize it's still the beginnings. I mean, this is really early times. And it's great that we're starting to talk about theory and get to that point and to understand that we have these very different genre that need really very different approaches. And we're still kind of figuring out, you know, I mean, what it means, but also what kind of texts are out there. So 
you know, it's a work that's made a lot of progress, but it's still very much a work in progress. And I remember from grad school days, there was kind of a timeline. It takes about 200 years for Buddhism to really settle into a culture, you know, where people read the text, they understand it, and then finally it takes on the distinct form of that culture. We, you know, with modern media, we're probably going to accelerate that, but I, I don't think we're there yet. I don't think it's by any means fully absorbed. So I just want to describe what, what's happened to me over the years as I got pulled back into translating. And I'm, I'm not a person to talk about the what, because I've rarely chosen. I, I was going to do the Lamrim Chemo. I spent a year, I got like really one chapter's worth in, because I, my style is to dig in so tight, and I thought, my god, this would take the rest of my life. Um, and I passed it off to a group, where it was done as a group project with ten translators, and, and came out as a three-volume set. Um, but then people started twisting my arm to do different projects. So I've landed up in three very different projects right now and have been interested in watching myself adjust from a literal style or, or at least come to see things very differently in terms of what the text is. And I'm in three completely different worlds. I'm, I'm working with Jeffrey Hopkins on his translation of Geluk Yikcha. And of course, it's the hardest and most complicated Yikcha. Um, and it's it's a group project, people working on different parts of text. Um, Jeffrey's doing the final putting it together. And it's a very interesting project. It's being, the results are being posted online so that anybody can access them. You would, you would never get those books published as books. But it's fascinating because given Jeffrey's um, rigidity and terminology, it's the same across this huge variety of texts. And that's really useful to see, because in the dissertation model of studies, one, people are praised for coining new terms, and two, the vocabulary that works in like epistemology doesn't necessarily work as well in Madhyamaka, and it shifts. But it's really interesting to see that same terminology across a variety of texts. And even in that project, which in a way you could call the most literal, it's, it's not literal in the sense of nothing different's being done. It's being done as a dual language project with Tibetan and English there so people can see it. Because it's so hard to understand debates and follow them, it's color-coded. If it's a correct position, it's in blue. If it's an incorrect <laughs> position, it's in red. Um, you know, it, it makes it so much easier. And also, <laughs> it spells out. It's, you don't just say the reason's not established. It's saying, you know, what is it that's not established? What, you know, I don't agree that all colors are red, whatever. So that it's, things have been done to make it much more accessible to a reader. Now, this is technical writing. You know, it's like a physics textbook. Nobody's ever going to pick it up and read it just because it's fun, but it's a very useful tool. And I think the world deserves to have at least one set of monastic yiksha translated and available to understand that this is what monks have studied for centuries and that it produced some of the greatest scholars many of us have ever met. So, you know, it's a chunk. It's not everybody's cup of tea, but it's something that I've been able to feel comfortable working with, basically. Um, and then I got pulled into another project by my dear friend, Anne Klein. She's such an arm twister, I have to tell you. <laughs> but, uh, and this is Nyingma um, preparatory practice text. And it's a text by Adzum Brimche, uh, the previous Adzum Tuku. And it's a, a kind of a condensed version taking off on Zad Patrol's text, which in English is the um, words, of, my perfect teacher. words of my perfect teacher. And it's fascinating because he simplified it. Um, he's, he's, and sometimes he, it's way shorter. Um, some parts of it are very similar. Some parts of it are very different. Um, in that world, Anne's over there far, much farther than me on let's make it pretty. And I'm always going, but this is what it says. <laughs> but it's very interesting because that's a whole different genre. And, and Words of My Perfect Teacher has already made the jump to comprehensible. It's a practice text. People are using it. And, you know, there's no reason to, to hold out for a very literal approach. The interesting thing to me about the text is that um, it's, it, because so much of it is almost paraphrased, but it's not, if you look at the Tibetan of both, he's actually, he's changed it or he's stuck in another sentence. Also, just looking at what he's omitted, which is all of the Gadamba stuff, um, 
which is the long stories that make up words of my perfect teacher. And he's looked back, he's used more of Jigme Lingpa, he's looked more for sutra quotes, some sutra quotes I've never seen before. So it's a, but that part of it, you don't need to, it doesn't have to show up in the English. If people are really interested, you can look at the Tibetan. We should write an introduction that really points out what's happened. But there's no need to have a literalness that, to think that both texts should be so literal that you could see that in the English. It's, it's like way one bridge too far, and I don't think it would help. It's not, you know, that's a whole different world. And then the third thing I got pulled into, which, which really shifted my thinking in a way, is um, translating, doing oral translating and of text, but that are being used for transmissions without any commentary. So you have a group of students coming in, they're getting a transmission, um, but it's just, it's just a transmission. And thinking about how to deal with that, it, I didn't want to, it doesn't help if I'm just struggling through trying to sight read a text in a, in, a, in a teaching session. I found it was far more effective to pre-translate it, but to simplify it to be aware of the fact that even though I'm using a written text, I need to unpack it. I need to shorten the sentences. I need to put in the reference. Because here are these poor people. This is their one shot to get it. And I'd better make it something that's short enough that they can get it. You know, you don't want, and this is one of my pet bugaboos. I never liked going to lectures where someone read a paper. Because I just don't think that the, you know, what was written to be, what do you say, literature, works as a, as a spoken topic, mostly. So there was that shortening, and then I got pulled into reworking the practice texts, 20-year-old translations that needed to be updated. And again, if you're asking someone to say something every day for possibly the rest of their lives, and often in group sessions with many people, it can't be ugly. It can't be clunky. So suddenly the fact that English has so many more words, so many ways to say beautiful, far more than Tibetan, in my view, you know, all those words become important. And, and one of the things that really opened my eyes to that was that one of the texts I was given was something where Chigi Nyima, Richard Barron, had written the concluding prayer. He had translated the concluding prayers years ago. And they were so beautiful. And I didn't touch them. I mean, you will never improve upon Chigi's translation of these verses because they're just gorgeous. And that's important. You know, that was people who were coming from other centers and were using those texts would just go, oh, these prayers are such a delight at the end of the day. So, you know, we were talking a lot yesterday in terms of kind of bigger picture things, you know, prioritizing the reader, which is exactly what I've ended up with in kind of as I've worked through things and fidelity to readers versus fidelity to the original, fidelity to literary style. I think all of those things are important. Um, and it was just interesting to me to kind of learn that just from my own experience, realizing how much I had to adjust what I was doing to who I was translating for. Thanks. Um, it's a real pleasure and privilege to be part of this panel discussion. And, um, and like the last conference, um, in 2014, this conference was also a uh, deeply educational experience for me, particularly having speakers coming from completely outside our field. Um, you know, this morning's presentation of taking us back to the very, very old days when Chinese translators were struggling with the Buddhist text was a real eye-opening. And, and, you know, the, one of the things that came out very clearly yesterday in Professor Pesnitz's um, presentation as well as in the evening discussion with Professor Bellows and Professor Gomez and Jonathan Gold was the paradoxical nature of translator and translation. Um, I love the phrase that uh, Professor Pesnitz, um, you know, used, which was passively present and actively absent. That sort of sums up the paradox. Um, you know, I sort of stumbled into uh, the translation work um, not out of my choice. I happened to be one of the few Tibetan monks who had facility with English, ended up working for His Holiness, and then, you know, teaching, uh, in translating primarily oral teachings by him, then later having to work on the text. Um, so when I first started working on the text, I then started taking a much more critical look on you know what the what the act is, what the act is 
And this is where my own Giluk monastic training comes in. Giluk monastic trainings are a bit like analytic philosophy. It's always critically self-reflective. You know, it's just not going straight, but asking yourself a question, what exactly are you doing? And you know, um, I didn't have a chance to look at the Western theorizing, but I looked at the Tibetan sources, um, one of which was the ninth century uh, catalog that was created, glossary that was created, and it has a preamble on, which really sets out some of the kind of you know norms of how to go about translating, including even relation to foreign words like lotus is pema in Tibetan, and lotus never existed in Tibetan. So what do you do? Do you coin a new term, or do you leave the old one? And the instruction was, you leave the old one, but modify it so that it sounds easier to the Tibetan tongue. Jodewa, because Padma is, doesn't work, and lion is Singhi. Singhi is a, you know, sort of a, a Tibetan word used, you know, taken out of Sanskrit, which is Sina, but Na and Ha don't go really easy on Tibetan tongue, so it's turned into Singhi. So they were, careful considerations made on those. And then, of course, Jonathan Gold talked about Sapin, who has a much more systematic thinking. Um, on the Western Front, when I was at Cambridge, I did look at Steiner's uh, The Babel book, um, which, of course, is very densely written. You could read only two or three pages at a time. Um, but what I did realize fairly early, looking at the Tibetan translators theorizing as well as Steiner's work was um, really this tension between the fidelity to the text on the one hand and in the consideration of the reader and readability to the, in, the, in the target language. And on this point, um, I'm in a slightly odd position as Alex pointed out. You know, I'm one of the odd men out here translating into not one's own mother tongue, but into a foreign tongue. But um, fortunately, I'm not like the early Chinese translators who are, you know, because Tibetan, the source language is my mother tongue. <laughs> so I have advantage there. So I, I realized that the, the translators really need two, um, of course, many competencies, but the two main competencies are very obvious. One is some ability to comprehend the text that you are translating. <laughs> um, and there, as a native speaker, I don't have to struggle at all. And fortunately, I, because of my monastic training, um, I don't have to struggle there. But the other one is the ability to somehow reproduce it in the target language. So whatever that reproduce means, we, we had discussions about functional equivalence and all the rest, um, ability to reproduce that. And this is one area where I have to work harder because English is not my mother tongue. You know, despite the, the appearance of my fluency, I acquired, you know, mastered it much later in my life. I didn't learn it properly as a kid. So it's always going to be, as the scientists would say, it would be coming from my right brain <laughs> rather than the left brain. Um, so, uh, so when I get Alzheimer's, these are one of the words, the English words are going to go out first. Um, <laughs> so, so that meant I really had to work hard. And the way in which I did that was to really reading widely, not necessarily text alone that are connected with the topic, because you know, uh, in, the, in the opening dinner, I talked about my fascination for English and my admiration for it. And the con contrast between English and Tibetan is so great. You know, English has a, a sort of an immediacy. It's a very practical language. Right from the beginning, when you get go, you read the sentence, it tells the reader where you're going. You know, Tibetan isn't like that. It's quite oblique, you know. Um, so, so I think there is that. So which means English, if we are really willing to produce something in English, there's a lot more language facility in the English language. If we don't use it, you know, we'll be doing a disservice to the reader. And you know, I may be naive or maybe overly optimistic, but when I translate, I, I actually try to imagine what someone with no Buddhist background would engage this text and try to. And the way I do this, is actually I read it aloud. Once I've done, I you know I do the first, I do a word by word translation, so that there is a very literal reproduction of the text, so that you you know you get all the elements, the grammatical elements are reproduced, not necessarily in exactly the same form, but if there is a subject, object, whatever it is, and then I do a second round editing 
and then final third level editing. And once I've done the third level editing, I actually read it aloud. And particularly if it is verse, I really read it aloud. And there are, I always believe that if the original is in verse, and I'm going to bring that up in, in the workshop, you know, there are various categories of text that are written in verse for what, different reasons. And if the original is in verse, I genuinely believe the translation should be in verse. Uh, because readers generally tend to engage with verse differently, almost subconsciously, without thinking. And we would want to make that possible, even in a translated text. And also one thing that I uh, realized in my own work is, um, so which means, as much as possible, as David Bellows yesterday you know, beautifully put it, don't leave the door too wide open for untranslated terms. You know, so, you know, right now I'm editing many of the Indian Buddhist classics that are in Tibetan. And like Tarka uh, Jawala, Blaze of Reasoning, I'm editing it. it. The Sanskrit doesn't exist. So there are references to Indian non-Buddhist philosophers, which are, their names are translated. It's a, such a struggle and waste of time trying to figure out who those guys were. <laughs> if their names have been kept in original Sanskrit, it would be very easy. So, um, so I think it's... As much as possible, I try to imagine the reader. And for example, right now I'm finishing up my editing of Tsongkhapa's Bombarapsel, which is his you know, major commentary on Chantakirti, and hopefully it will come out in 2019, which is going to be the 600th anniversary of Tsongkhapa's Nirvana. And on the section dealing with emptiness philosophy, I would hope, you know, given my training in Cambridge philosophy, that a Western philosopher would pick this up and would at least find out that there is an argument going on there. <laughs> what is the premise? What is the reason? What kind of rationale is being used? What is the line of thinking here? What are the assumptions being made? I would hope that a reader would pick it up. I mean, of course, even in English, if you have an analytic philosophy book, we don't expect, unless you have some academic background, to be able to actually understand it. And that's even in English. The same would apply to a text on Nagarjuna's text, even in English. Yeah, even in Tibetan, we would expect to have some background of scholarship. Mm -hmm. But the English, one would hope that the text would stand on its own, you know, up to a point. So I think that has been my aim, and that has also influenced my editorial policy for the Library of Tibetan Classics. And so there are a couple of translators who have, been, who have worked on those projects. And, um, you know, I never impose vocabulary, because vocabulary is up to the individual, and I think it's too early to really standardize and uniform, may come up with a uniform. Where I do insist is a careful look at the reproduction of the syntax. Because if you reproduce the Tibetan syntax, it's really tough. And, and so this is where, so what I do is I do spot checks five or ten times, and different, I look at the Tibetan, because the classic series have the Tibetan page number inserted in the English text. So I can immediately find, and if, you know, out of five, the problem is only with one, then I sort of let go. But if out of five, there are three or four problematic pages, then I have to read quite substantially. And then I reach out to the translator, and sometimes it involves quite substantial revision, uh, which of course doesn't make the translator happy, um, but, but, you know, to give, I mean, to, to, uh, what we do is we have actually made this known to the editor right from the beginning, translator. So we have editorial policy, so they know what they have signed up to. So these are the things that have shaped my own approach. And basically, you know, although the target language is not my mother tongue, as much as possible, I try to make it natural English. And I always give it to a natural English speaker to edit it at the end. Mm -hmm. And, and also, I look at other resources. For example, when I was translating the Book of Gadang, which is you know, 40, 40 to 60 percent in poetry, I read Dante's translation, translation of Dante, because it's already been translated from another language, and how fluid the English is, and to try to capture that ability to convey something in long you know, you know, verses with long lines, you know, without being awkward. And I read Dante quite carefully to get that kind of feel. Mm -hmm. And so that the, when I worked on the final editing of the Book of Kadam, the poetic sections would have that kind of 
the Book of Gadam is not written in a classical poetry. It's written in very vernacular style, very kind of earthy poetry. And somehow I was trying to bring that out. So those are the considerations I try to bring in my own work. And um, as much as possible, at least the people on whom I have some influence are the translators who are working for my series. So I also appeal to them. Sometimes it's a hard negotiation when something is done. People think it's done. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, uh, and, and you know, I remember very clearly what Bello said, David Bello said last time, you know, be kind to your reader. And I think that is very important. Thank you. Thanks. I have so many questions for all of them already. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my most immediate is, did you read all 182 translations? <laughs> okay. Maybe just 100. Huh? Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, a good, it's a good life when, uh, when a Tibetan can be on stage saying he's reading uh, George Steiner and an Inji can be on stage saying he's trying to work through Dundrupyal, huh? two literary theorists from very different worlds. Huh? It's also a good life when you go into a Starbucks in the middle of America and there's someone reading a commentary on the Kavya Darsha in Tibetan uh, at the table right next to you, and then you look up and it's all full of Tibetanists. Huh? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Okay. Um, uh, workshop. Um, what, what, how, and workshop? Yeah? What is poetry for me right now? How is, to be honest, any way I can? And um, the workshop, you know, that's a great question. Um, I think it's, you know, the sum total of our literary and emotional and communal lives, right, that goes into translation. Yeah, it's, a, it's a deeply intense process which touches all aspects of life. But um, let me answer that workshop issue with a more focused answer and take you into um, a set of four terms from, um, let's see here, from this work, Dun Yuk Yao's Poki Guru Dun Lujudan Kecho, History and Features of Tibetan Poetry, which was Dun Gao's master's thesis and was published first in 85 and um, later in his uh, really amazing collected works in 97, I believe. And um, over the past several years, I've been trying to improve my translation of Tibetan poetry or at least make it a more meaningful, in-depth process for myself, if nothing else. And uh, one of the things I've tried to do is find conversation partners within the Tibetan tradition uh, who are talking, classical and contemporary traditions, uh, who are talking about aesthetics and who are talking about literary theory um, and literary history, too. And Dondrup Gao, I found this book in particular has been very useful to work with. He's inspiring. I don't understand all of it. It's a complex work with, um, with many uh, strands of arguments. Uh, but one of the things he does is he provides this nice rubric um, to talk about poems. And uh, this comes in the latter half of his book. He's given in the first half of his book a history of Gulu, of poetry, which he begins with Dunhuang uh, uh, poetry and goes all the way up um, to some contemporary poetry, uh, but really ends with Shapkar. He's re he really loves Shapkar, and it had been published at the time. Uh, Shapkar's songs and autobiography uh, had been published um, in uh, uh, um, modern prints, modern reprints during that time, so he had access to them too, and they're just rich treasuries, as you all know, of poetry. So Lu, Sok, Gen, and Nam uh, are the final four chapters of his book. Uh, and I'm going to translate here uh, simplistically. Each of these is a very rich term, uh, form, content, figure, and feeling. And, and I know for myself, I spend most of the time on content. I want to know what it means. I want to have some sense that I, I'm, I've I'm reproducing that meaning accurately. Um, I, I want to have some sense that, um, um, that there's a richness to both the, the gritty reality of any particular term and its, its um, let's say, metaphorical, symbolic uh, associations. And, um, and, and, and that's a big challenge. But lately, I've wanted to focus more on form and figure, especially what you'll hear more about uh, today in this, in this afternoon's uh, workshop led by Nicole Willick and Ginnan Rapsal uh, on Kavya. Uh, 
So figure, uh, figurative speech, and then yam, feeling, which for me is the hardest one. It's a technical language uh, going back in Tibetan, at least to the time of uh, Sakyapandita, and uh, was taken up by literary theorists uh, in, um, uh, in, the, in the ensuing centuries, and it's used today by uh, Tibetan commentators on poetry, both Kavya poetry, ornate poetry, uh, and um, Gurlu, song, song poetry, too. Um, a great example uh, uh, that I just learned about from my colleague Gennon Ropsal is Dunkar Lozon Trinle's uh, commentary on the Kavya Darsha, where he begins not by talking about Kavya verses, but by talking about uh, Gulu, by talking about um, contemporary um, and early modern religious poetry, and saying, yes, you can use a system of uh, sentiment, uh, sentiment going back to the time of uh, Sakyapandita to, uh, to uh, let's say, increase your appreciation of different kinds of poetry, even if they don't necessarily have anything to do with the technical writing that is Kavya. So form, um, content, figure, and feeling. So what I want to do is go through one verse by Shapkar that Dondup Gao cites. And here's the verse. Let me just hold it up for a second. We'll see it again, but this is the biggest I'm able to project it on this screen. So, Gurlu Yibumo Bakmala Zangyu it's a great little verse. What Dundrup Gao does with this verse uh, is he really uses it for one purpose. He cites it out of context. It doesn't tell you where it's from. Now, this is in the chapter on Lu. He cites this verse. And what he wants to do is show you an example of five-syllable verse, a five-syllable quatrain. There's two types of five-syllable quatrains in Dundrup Gao's analysis of the Lu of poetry. And this one is the first one, three syllables, followed by two, two syllables. Guluyi bumo, bagmala zanya, namchuki shunu, suwala pepsho. So um, I wouldn't really say this is a workshop for me. It's more of a sandbox. Um, <laughs> so, so here's what I did with it. Um, I tried to play around with it. And, and it's, uh, I hope you'll agree that um, if the effort is not pretty, it's something that um, one might emulate, right? Working with a, a, a rubric given by an expert, such as Dundrup Gao, uh, to try and increase your understanding and your appreciation, I would say, uh, more importantly, of a given piece of poetry. So here's the form is five syllable. Here's what I think the content basically is. It's a boy meets girl story. Um, you know, you could go through word by word. Um, uh, more metaphorically, it's maybe song meets intellect and um, uh, something I didn't really think of until um, I spoke about this verse uh, again with Gennon Rapsal. It's teacher engages student, too. We'll get to that towards the end. Um, the figure, I think it's a metaphor. Yeah? Um, and the feeling, this is the toughest one. Um, uh, I chose the first one. To me, my first thought when I read this and, and thought I had some understanding of it with, uh, was um, it made me happy. It was pleasurable, yeah? There was maybe even, um, um, there was, um, Jimba calls uh, Gekpa uh, elegance, I think, yeah? in songs of spiritual experience, yeah? Passion is another one, right? um, eroticism, right? There's a whole range of terms, but, but I, I, felt like, I felt like I felt it, yeah? It felt something to me. Um, but, honestly, I spend the most time working with content and not so much time working on the other three, yeah? So, um, so here's some playing with... Uh, a prose version, the girl of song, his scent is a bride, the boy of judgment should go to welcome her. I'm playing with the trope, those, trying to work out the meaning here. There's t I have ten um, um, versions of this uh, song here. So um, Here's prose divided into um, some more lines. Yeah? The girl of song, his scent is a bride, the boy of judgment should go to welcome her. This is, um, this is to be honest, um, where I stop a lot of the time, right? I make a prose version, I divide it into four lines, and I've got a quatrain, yeah? <laughs> yeah. It's, um, it's an embarrassing place to stop, yeah? Uh, but anyway. I, although, uh, to be honest, maybe one should stop there at some point, yeah. Um, so here I'm trying, to, um, I'm trying to take form, I'm trying to take sound more seriously. I don't know if this is a good idea, but it's fun to do. Hmm? Um, so I'm trying to play with the first word of each Tibetan. So trying to capture gur and bakma and namcha and sua at the beginning of a line of um, um, what I'm now um, deeming to call verse. Huh? Poetry girl, the bride has been offered, discerning young la lad, receive her, go now. 
Yeah, so um, I don't have a, I guess I have a question about that, right? When you want to focus on a particular uh, um, portion of the Tibetan and you want to try and capture that, and it's not the content, right? where do you go? How do you approach that? Right? What cues from the Tibetan or from uh, uh, commentators such as Don Gal and others do you, do you go to to try and um, eke out that meaning in some different way? Here's another one, playing with the first consonant sound of each line. So trying to get g, b, n, s, yeah? girl of poetry, the bride sent away, knowledge boy, step out to welcome her. It's probably terrible, but it's a fun exercise, right? <laughs> right? And this is the kind of thing, you start out with something that's probably awful, and I'm sorry, I don't have anything good to offer you, but I think it's, it's the exercise that matters, right? Of trying to constrain yourself in a particular way, for a moment at least, right? And then eventually maybe something will begin to naturalize within the way that you, you read and eventually translate something like this. Um, here's five syllables, just tr trying to play with five syllables in English. Poetry maiden uh, has been sent to wed, inquiry fellow must go to welcome her. <laughs> Um, here's a haiku, poetic maiden, <laughs> delivered to be a bride. It's an English haiku. Yeah? Uh, greet her, clever boy. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny even now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, I think one of the best things about Shabkar um, um, is that he's humorous. Right? Right? He gives you this great song about um, the mountains and the trees and the rivers and the birds, and you think there's going to be some profound point at the end of it. And what does he say? He's taking a nap. He's going to take a nap. Right? This is really nice up there. <laughs> uh, let's see, what am I doing here? Oh, playing with English verse forms. A fun thing, again. I think uh, it's, uh, uh, it's very artificial, but I think there's a real value in this. At least I found it to be meaningful. A girl of song and poetry sent out to be a bride. The boy of sharp acuity. To greet her, he must ride. So there's iambic... <laughs> Tetrameter and rhymes, too. Yeah, two rhymes. Well, you know, I don't think he would have approved. Um, here's, here's something. So five syllables in, in the Tibetan line, it's not so much, right? There are four syllable. There's some four-syllable line poetry in Shapkar. Really, only a few examples. Um, uh, Don Rupkel gives one. Um, but here, just trying to make the English more compact. So emulate this, this sense of compactness. Song girl, bride bound, thought boy, meet her. <laughs> um, playing with a sense of a larger theme. Here, I really, I think I've really thrown away any kind of good, accurate sense of nam show by calling it reason. But song girl senses a bride, reason boy, go to greet her. So here I'm trying to imagine what larger themes he might have had in mind, the relationship um, between uh, uh, song and uh, um, wisdom or analytical uh, wisdom. Um, there's probably many places to take this, right? So you could um, work on this being a, um, um, a more technical song if you wanted to look at that um, nam show in more detail. Okay, um, so then I asked Gendon Rapsal to read this with me, and he said, oh, this is, this is um, it, you shouldn't put in um, passive like this. You should make it uh, first person and second person. This is Shapkar. Uh, talking to a student, and he's saying, I sent that song, that, that song girl to be your bride. So you, student, right, who's maybe over-analytic, right, you go, go, go marry that song. Yeah? So it's and much different, right? And then so you've got to do the whole thing over with some different pronouns, yeah? I and you here. Um, so let me just conclude by asking all of you, um, how do these four areas produce meaning? Yeah, I think it's pretty clear that they do. Um, and, you know, sometimes we like a translation because it feels good more than anything else, right? And um, it's accurate, sure, but it feels good. And we don't quite have a language in our community to, to break that down, right, and to reproduce it with any degree of um, 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 success. Uh, and then when does this question matter, I think, is an important point. Um, and then I just want to conclude by saying uh, there's lots of Tibetan literary theory out there, and it's really good and fun to think with. So thank you. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me to be on this panel, and it's a great pleasure to be here once again.
uh, really enjoying this conference and it, having been here the last time as well, it feels to me, I don't know if you all agree, but um, last time there was at least some sort of sense of like the practitioners and the academics. I don't know, that divide is, the, the boundary has been breached in a lot of ways much more and doesn't, I don't know, I don't feel it yet anyway, may, maybe after my talk. But, um, <laughs> but I don't know which side I'll fall on. Um, <laughs> So I was just trying to f uh, follow the instructions of, not to say the others didn't, but of... <laughs> uh, one point, actually, uh, you know, so just make one point. Um, so it's basically a, a sort of theoretical point of an idea I'm trying to develop, which I've just called resonant reference. But already when I hear that, it doesn't sound very good. R resonant reference, I was also going to call it referential, uh, uh, referential resonance, anyway. And also a related practical point about how to get there. And it's, I'm taking uh, my remarks basically from my own experience. Uh, and largely in my own case, the translating that I have done has been really, every time I've translated a work, I have made it a point to work on that translation very closely with a Tibetan colleague, an expert in the material that I'm studying. So it's a lot about that relationship between the Tibetan counterpart. Uh, but I, I will also try to say that the, the kind of principle that I'm trying to tease out, I think also could apply and does apply, even to those cases where the individual is simply reading a text on their own without necessarily reading it with a teacher. There's something about the relationship with the teacher, well, not necessarily teacher, but colleague, let's say, and also a relationship between the translator and simply the text itself. And basically, it, I'm just trying to get at one very sort of a slender slice of the act of translation, which I would say has to do with the sort of positionality or the attitude or the place where one is uh, that then allows you to actually make choices and to make a translation. So it's not going to be about the actual choices you make, but the place that you are at epistemologically, let's say, as a translator. And I, this is a very, it's subtle, it's hard, it's hard to talk about it because I think it's all always quite implicit or even invisible. But it has to do with some of the, many of the things that people have already been talking about and about sort of catching the, the rhetorical thrust of you know, what's really being said and the, the kind of world in which it is resonating with. So the point, the thrust, and I, you can also talk about a somewhat related notion of the imaginaire, this French term, it's like the, the whole imagined realm in which the particular idea in the thing that you're translating is kind of forming a piece with and how to get yourself in that and seeing those connections. Uh, and, there's, and so the question is how do you get at that? And there I think there's so many clues at so many different levels. Certainly the whole issue of syntax with which uh, Tuntun Jimala brought up already, even though we all agree that you can't necessarily slavishly follow the Tibetan syntax when you're translating it into English. In the initial moment of reading Tibetan, I believe that syntax is extremely important. Syntax really tells you a lot in Tibetan. And the syntax, it's not just, oh, this is a, a thing about Tibetan, that its syntax goes one way. There's something about the thought process of what words are mentioned first and, and the emphasis of what comes later. There's also the rhythm of the work, and rhythm is not only in verse. I think there, there's a lot of oral dimensions, the cadence uh, of, of, the, of the sentence or whatever it is itself, which often will give you a lot of clues. In addition, um, there's something about the, um, also uh, not just a person that you're reading with, but somehow detecting or discerning the, the voice and the, and the position of the author. In other words, what is being accomplished when the author is writing? So these are, these, I'm really actually throwing out a lot of different ideas, I apologize, but they're all over the place, but trying to gather them together. Things about the status of the utter, utter, utterer. So the, the author, you know, what is the author establishing or about her or himself? What is the prestige, as one example, in, 
in writing or saying these things? Or, or how is the author positioning her himself? Uh, is there deferentiality in, in what's being, is, is, is it an attitude of deference? Or a, is it, for example, an attitude of repetition? So often uh, when, you're tr when you're giving that sort of doctrinal discourse, you're actually, there's something about saying what everybody has heard like a million times, but you're repeating it again and sort of occupying that place. These, there's, a, there's a lot of different ways of looking at what I'm calling this um, resonant reference or referential resonance. Um, uh, uh, and, and the way that it's always referring to a world of meaning. I think that some texts have that more than others. Some texts have a much more dense and certainly, Kavya, like for example, is one example where there's all these, you know, very inten you know, intended references to mythology and stories and other images that are known. There's all, it's all about intertextuality and shared values and so on. But, you know, I, I would argue if like I was ever going to sit down and try to write a theory of this, that this, this is true of all language. All words do this. Every word participates in a matrix, in a lexicon, in which you only understand its meaning by knowing what its relationship is to other words. It's actually, it's like structuralism in Western philosophy or it, even the famous Apoha theory in Buddhist philosophy is really drawing on the same insight that, that nothing has meaning in, except in comparison with other things and how it connects to those other things. So how to get at that? Uh, unfortunately, this morning, uh, I well, fortunately, uh, uh, in, in, in preparing this talk, I was reading a very thin little book by Paul Ricoeur on translation. I believe the title might be on translation. I was going to read you a passage from him, but this morning in rushing to get the bus, I forgot the book <laughs> in the room. But anyway, what he, he had this brilliant little statement about, you know, so he's calling this semantic fields. And how, of course, how difficult it is, and that's a lot of what we've been talking about, again, is how difficult it is, you know, whenever you make a choice in English, the, the English words have their own referentiality in their own semantic field. You can't reproduce all of those. You, you can't get exact mirror image in English from the Tibetan. And yet, at the same time, one tries. So it's not as, just because you can't get that don't, doesn't mean that you don't give up on that. And there's actually ways to get at it to a certain extent. Just one more phrase from Ricoeur, and I'm sorry I don't have the whole passage to read to you. Uh, he had a wonderful phrase called, the ethics of translation as interlinguistic hospitality. <laughs> I thought it was really nice. So that just shows you how great Ricoeur is to read, so you should go and read that book. Um, and um, so a little bit about how some of this, I, and, and that's in this very special case where you're translating with another, an expert, native language reader. Uh, and this is the practical side of it. The most important part of this, and I believe very strongly, and it is as a practice, is as a translator, you have to learn how to shut the hell up and how to shut your, your mind and your expectations up in order to listen and to notice what's happening in your colleague which you can see many, many things to shut. And this, this also, Susan uh, Bassnett yesterday talked about this a lot. I was really happy to hear her uh, about shutting off your own sense of your own mastery. And surely, as many of us mature, you know, you more and more sense, I can read this. I, I know what it means. But how important it is to remain open to your colleague who's going to maybe often give you a different reading, as Curtis just uh, showed us in that final verse when he finally talked to Gindan Rupsell, he, and at least I finally figured out what the verse meant. Totally. Um, <laughs> after you, you know, be, uh, anyway, um, I'll come back to that. <laughs> uh, it's a, both about hearing and seeing in terms of hearing, lis listening to how Tibetans read a sentence. And I've also often had the experience, I'm sure many of you have as well, you're looking at a Tibetan sen sentence, you don't quite understand it, even though you know most of the words. And your Tibetan colleague will, will just read it in Tibetan. They won't translate or say anything, but just when you hear where they pause and their, their, their rhythm, you, then you get it, you know, just that. And, and how to sort of get that voice in your own head. Uh, again, you have to be quiet in order to hear the other. And also then watching. Uh, 
um, body language, um, the way, the, and I've, I often spend a lot of time looking at the reactions of my colleague in terms of when they smile, when, of what they're reading, when they tense up, when they're being uh, devoted. So you, you, you'll be reading a text and, you know, the, the, your Tibetan colleague will go, oh, you know, and, and when, when they do that, you know, you, you got, a, a, you know, but that brings you to that epistemological state, I think, that you need to kind of mm. enter that space in order to be a good translator, mm. et cetera. Just a couple of examples in my own case. I just remember, for example, a long time ago, I, I, a lot of my early t uh, training in Tibetan was with the wonderful Lama Deshung Rinpoche, who was in Seattle at the time. And I was very fortunate to spend a lot of time with him. We were reading Lamdre literature. And I remember reading the, you know, a lot about samsara and about the hells and how, as he was reading it, you know, his, his reaction of compassion, you know, oh, to oh, it's so, you know, oh, it's so terrible, <laughs> you know, and, and, and that was all this extra emotion, but it made me understand what the work was saying. At the same time, fear also, I remember when he was reading the hells, Ooh, you know, he said, even I, I am, I, I continually, I'm afraid, I'm, I'm, ah, she do, she do, you know, when I'm going to die, what's going to happen to me? But it's, you know, and the time I said, come on, you know, you're not, you're not going to hell, but, but it, it <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> Uh, uh, I also, I had great fortune and I also spent a lot of time with Kalu Rim, Rinpoche. I lived in the same house with him also for a long time. And I'll just, this is just a brief thing. There was this, this one phrase, some of you may know, uh, Deso Meba, you know, Kowa ta, ta, ta De, like in directionality, Teso Meba, it's a... Teso Meba. Yeah, te, mm -hmm. Teso Meba. Uh, and how he tried to, it, it means no focus or no... No, no aiming. That's obviously a state of mind in Mahamudra. I don't have to tell you guys about that. But he trying to gesture what that meant, you know, and he kept, I, I can't now reproduce exactly his body language, but I remember him, keep, I, and I kept saying, oh, you mean that? And he said, no, 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 no. And then he would do this thing again. Uh, another example is um, when I read the translation of Jigme Lingpa's Namtar, with uh, with several teachers, but in particular with Kempo Belden Sharap. And I, you know, like many of you, I'm one of those people who likes to do every word, get a total literal translation, and then try to massage it and make it better. And I remember trying to pin him down on the grammatical case, you know, of, you know, each, you know, syllable in the sentence. And it suddenly became this hysterical exercise when the thing that we were reading about was, you know, expanding into pure, you know, <laughs> space and, you know, no time. And, and it, it, everyone was laughing at me, you know, it was just totally violating. But it also made me realize something about the translation. <laughs> I, said, I said, come on, it still matters, you know. Um, what, um, how the same principle, oh, and I, I just wanted to mention that it's not only necessarily Dharma. My current work is, I'm working on Kavya as well. And I'm working with Gen Pema Bum, who's a wonderful, very knowledgeable reader of poetics. And I'm having much that same, you know, fascinating experience with him. It's not necessarily about religious transmission, but it is about that interlinguistic hospitality and all that that in implies. Um, I, I do think that the same principles, slightly differently accessed, just happens when you read a text. Because there's so much especially the more, for example, if you're translating a sutra, uh, there's so much that we're already familiar with, with genre conventions, with rhythms, with repeating passages, with our own knowledge. That, but there is nonetheless a way in which I think as a translator, at a certain point, you do have to read the text and, and sort of let it sort of speak to you in this larger way that you sort of see, you know, where it's positioned in the universe and the things that it's saying. Uh, as, as a way to enhance your line by line and even word by word translation. Um, uh, often, you know, I often, when I'm reading something by myself in Tibetan, I now do this thing of reading it out loud to myself. Not, so you were talking about reading the translation aloud in English, which is, I think, a very, very good thing to do as well. Because in both, both ways, you kind of get a world. But you can read the Tibetan text, too. And often, you reading it to yourself, you, you can hear it. And then it makes more sense. Um, 
Okay, so that's really all I was going to say. I, I, I did think in the, the, the last example of the poems that you were, the, the various translations, I finally realized that what that poem is about is about um, uh, Shepgar, you know, promoting a poetic voice to the scholastic intellectual, so how to let poetry enter. And I didn't get that till Gidman Rupsell or whatever intervened. But, but you, you probably knew that before. Uh, I'd like to think that if I had gone and found that verse in context, I, I would have got that, but I didn't, did I? <laughs> <laughs> no, you were in some context. So anyway. Some other space, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Janet. <laughs> so we now have time for our four speakers to engage in conversation with each other. And uh, please, again, send questions down to Dominique, and she'll give them to me. Uh, Betsy, do you want to go first and raise some um, questions to? Actually, I'd like to Tanjimba to go next, because right. he had some interesting questions to bring up. Okay. Well, um, I don't know about the, I hope, uh, Janet, uh, at some point you will find a better term than referential residence, <laughs> whatever it is. But I think you are getting at something, uh, and, um, and you have articulated it really well. Um, I think this ability to somehow let the text speak to you, so that you, you, know, you need to have a kind of an openness of mind, so that you don't impose your pre kind of suppositions upon the text and and you know you in a way many of the texts that, that we are working on are kind of old texts so at least several century or at least a century removed from us so we have to somehow project our mind to that kind of period it's kind of an, an act of imagination um, you know I was um, you know when you were explaining these um, you know using this Paul Rickers kind of idea of interlingual Hospitality. I was thinking of my own, you know, I've done a number of translations, but the one that was most enjoyable was really the Book of Kadam. And I did it partly because, um, you know, the ancient Kadampas are very, not least appreciated, because there are no Kadamba school, and there's no Kadamba card-carrying member, so there's no loyalty. And Tibetans, you know, I can say it because I'm myself Tibetan, we're kind of still quite tribal people. That's why we tend to be quite strong in our identification with a particular school. So once you don't have Kadamba school, then of course the real Kadamba materials get neglected. Um, so the, the practical teachings like the Lojongs get absorbed by all the schools, and then the more unique Kadamba teachings like the Book of Kadam sort of gets left out as a, and then assumes a canonical status as a source for prophecies to legitimize certain lamas and so on. Um, but the, the Book of Kadam itself is a beautiful text. It's, it's a very, it, it's pre kavya literature, so the, you know, poetry is much more closer to the vernacular. There are also very different modalities, for example, like some sections where it's a one-liner, boom, 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 between Atisha and Drum Tampa. You know, what is this? It's this. You know, didn't you think about that? Yes. I mean, it's a one, boom, 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 and you need to somehow create that feeling of speed. You know, kind of, it's almost like kind of a, 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 what do you call this, a rap. It's like a rap, rap music, you know? And you need to, because the Tibetan reads, reads like a rap music, so you need to somehow create that in English too. And sometimes it goes into this very airy, fairy, you know, sort of elevated, you know, kind of almost like a kind of a nature-loving reflection, stepping back, looking at the sky kind of thing. Again, you need to create that in English because it's a different flavor. And getting that, um, you know, one of the things that I noticed is that when you read it aloud, it really, because in the end, you know, writing is, you know, I mean, this is one of the reasons this morning um, the question came up, why reluctance on the part of the Indians to write down their scriptures. And one of the reasons was, Written, written language was seen as a very poor form, substitute for the richness of the oral language. So, of course, the text has to stand on its own, but still you can help it by reading it aloud to yourself. So I think that's a, I hope that, you know, the main point is I really agree with all of what you said. And, uh, 
But one thing that I, want, I just want to throw out there is, uh, and this is something in, I am not exempting my own work as well. Um, as a Tibetan, and uh, you know, before I mastered the English, English language, I mastered the literary Tibetan, and I was brought up in the Kavya tradition at the feet of a master, learning how to use all these you know, poetry and writing all the examples on a daily basis and having read a lot of biographical literature and the philosophical literature. Um, Whenever I read translations of Tibetan texts, and I don't read that much, you know, I mean, there's no need, I can read the original, but occasionally I do read, and I've always found dissatisfied. And that includes my own work. When I look at my own translations, there's something about the Tibetan, you know, because for example, like Tsongkhapa's Li Xian Yingbo is a very difficult philosophical text. But I've memorized the whole text mm -hmm. when I was a monk. And you can, it's written, the, the, the Tibetan itself is so beautiful that when you chant it, it flows out of your mouth very fluidly. You look at the English text, oh my goodness, I mean, you know, <laughs> what's going on here? You know, I mean, like you don't see the argument, you know, it's, it's not straightforward. So I've, and, and I've been puzzled by this. And then recently I edited uh, Beth Newman's translation of the Lekshe volume, which has uh, Subhashita material with embedded stories, which are fleshed out in the commentary. And the stories, many of them are stories from Panchatantra. And while I was editing it, I looked at um, two different translations of Panchatantra because my Sanskrit isn't good enough. And Patrick Orwell's Oxford World Classics translation has many of the stories. And then I was comparing against our version of the story, same story. And there's just the world's apart. There's a kind of a fluidity, naturalness in the English translation from the Sanskrit. And the thing that we have produced is kind of an awkwardness. It's almost like having one clutch, one foot on, on the clutch. <laughs> and I don't know whether that is because we are not being bold enough, creative enough to use all the resources that are available in English. Or we are too worried about, you know, because the Tibetans, you know, we had this discussion. One thing that is interesting about the Tibetan language is that although it has very complex sentence structure, we don't have a relative clause. So that we have lots of subclauses. And you see relative clause-based complex sentences only in the translation from Sanskrit, because Sanskrit has relative clause. So I'm wondering to what extent that is what is making this problem. And I'm going to try to get into detail in, in the workshop today. But I, I don't know. I'm just going to throw it out there. You know, I mean, do you have any thoughts about this? Why is it that when a text produced from Tibetan to English is kind of a little clumsy in text to produce in English from Sanskrit, it's much more fluid? I mean, I don't know. Have you, I mean, or, or do people don't think that's the case? I'm just throwing it out there. I don't. Well, I jump in at the kind of the most basic level of that, which is that the text, producing it from that particular example, it was a translation itself. So now we're already a generation away from the original. And, and I'm, you know, so much translation gets done. I mean, if you look at the um, scriptures which were translated into Tibetan, that Tibetan is clunky, and it's so different from, for instance, the, Tsongkhapa's writing or Tsongkhapa's writing. Sure. And I, I feel that's a huge factor. Uh, but I don't think your mic is on. Uh, oh, it's, it's, maybe oh. Not. it's too far over. Okay. okay, sorry about that. So, I mean, that would be the first step. And then when you're starting with something clunkier, it encourages you more towards clunky. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I, the syntax thing is an interesting one because Sanskrit does flow smoothly. Yes. But I also feel like, you know, elegant writing written in Tibetan originally is so different from Tibetan that was translated, translated. from, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, but, one of the things about the relative clause is that even though Sanskrit, like Asian languages, have the verb at the end, but relative clause allows you to bring up the main verb earlier. earlier. Whereas that in Tibetan, you have to leave the main verb until the end. So you have this long sentence where, you know, you have the Buddha with all the attributes and everything, and in the end, basically, he turned the wheel of Dharma. Yeah. So, I mean, because of the relative, we don't have a relative clause. If there's a relative clause, 
the main verb will come early on, and then all the you know other attributes will follow from this. So anyway, but that's that's you know, and I'm I'm still done. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that it's the relative clause. Clause is the say. reason. You know, first of all, I would like to have a more detailed conversation with you. I should know better than arguing with you on grammar because I know you're an expert in Tibetan <laughs> grammar. Uh, so I, I'm sure you're right, but I'm still dubious that there isn't like an implied relative clause. But that aside, I, I really think the primary problem for Tibetan translation, and this is my honest opinion, is that we still too much exoticize and, and orientalize the, the whole Tibetan religious tradition that we're still, it's very hard to see the human, to see the places that we can relate to so that we know what, um, what um, risks we can take to make it more human. I think we're afraid to, to sort of Temper, uh, tamper with it, and we just want to leave it in its pristine form, and are, are just afraid to kind of, as you were saying, naturalize it into English. And I think the more that we think about the human side of what this dharma is really about, and how human the people were who were writing it, and all the, those other human conditions, I think it will. Open it, up. It, okay. it, will it, it helps. I think maybe we're overly concerned with accuracy and for very good reason because we don't have the history of scholarship um, that, that uh, Sanskrit studies yeah, does. We don't have two centuries of, um, oh. of uh, philological work and lexicographical work um, that's based on five centuries of work in Latin and Greek and et cetera, right, in terms of its method. Yeah, we don't have any of that right now. So you think it's just a matter of you know, slowly growing? No, I totally agree with Janet too, but, um, but, but I think that we, we're, we, we we have some more spade work to do in terms of uh, creating um, resources to get to accuracy more quickly. Mm. Yeah. And so then we can, maybe we be more free then to be more creative and to step away from um, syntax that we're, you know, that we tentatively understand. Yeah. But as Jen Natier pointed out just now, which is a great lesson, that those clunky translations mm -hmm worked relatively well. And, um, and it's true, our clunky translations are, I, I'm not sure they're not working well, or I'm not sure what it means to work well, but um, I mean, to the degree that people are practicing Buddhism and becoming Buddhist, but to the degree that we have the goal that people in other fields are gonna just read this material in a more general way in terms of philosophy and ethics and so on, then it can't be clunky because that just yeah. won't work. So it's totally yeah. goal-oriented. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question along those lines for you, Betsy. You, and I'm so happy you're translating scholastic textbooks because I, I do want to read them, and, and, but, but I won't ever practice them, but I don't want to read them in Tibetan. Um, <laughs> and so, but that's not my question. My question is, um, do you, are they aesthetically pleasing for you? And does that, does that matter for you when you translate them? You characterize them as technical manuals, which I don't know that I disagree with that, but there's an aesthetics to technical manuals, too. There's something satisfying, right, about a form that you are willing to walk away from, right, and put online or publish. Yeah, so where is that, right? Where is that? Maybe it's called resonance. Maybe it's called beauty. Maybe it's called some aesthetic appreciation or satisfaction. Is it there? <laughs> I wouldn't call it aesthetically yeah. pleasing. <laughs> um, I think what's there is the, um, it's more the intellectual interest mm -hmm. in this very fine tuning of meaning. Mm -hmm. and, and here is where the grammar becomes mm -hmm. so important because a tiny shift of a, of a grammatical particle makes this huge play of meaning mm -hmm. that shifts and is important. And then seeing it worked out, and, and with that precision that you can follow an argument, that you can look at it, and with the extra help of knowing that you're actually tracking how it was intended to go. But aesthetically pleasing, no. But it, 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 could, it could be that the aesthetics is one, I'm just guessing, is one of a certain satisfaction in you know getting it right, like getting the system down. Yeah. Here's the best, and here's the that, and these things fit together, and we yeah. got it all, and blah blah blah. Right. So that's a kind of aesthetic, a different aesthetic. Uh -huh. it, you may right. not be, it may not be your taste. Yeah. Is that your acting out of the resonance right there, like this? 
Actually, no, it's... Uh, I felt but, the resonance. <laughs> <laughs> the resonance, maybe I should clarify, it has to do with different uh, registers of worlds of meaning. So a lot, of, I think a lot of it has to do with personal sort of position and prestige and sort of positioning of oneself. So it's not, no, not only, it's, I'm not saying that you resonate with the text. I'm actually saying, what does the text, what kind of ideals does the text resonate with? Where, how does it connect with, with those? And when you see what those are and trying to put yourself in that place, then you might be able to reproduce it. So when you know the text is going, -den 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 -den, <laughs> then your English can also go. -den -den -den. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, you're talking about the Iqtar literature. Um, Iqtar literatures are generally actually supposed to be oral in style. Because they are written in the form in which they're debated, yeah. in the debating courtyard. But when you reproduce that in English, you end up having a very contrived language. Mm. Because even the debate language is a very contrived Tibetan. It's been deliberately developed for a particular, you know, it's a bit like, you know, British parliamentarians. Mm -hmm. They have a, a very interesting way of raising a question in the parliament and, mm. you know, with all the rituals. So the rules. Mm. Yeah, rules and rituals that goes with it. And, you know, I don't know to what extent it can be, that that part of it can be reproduced. I mean, mm. that's... Right. Well, that's, you're not going to capture the, the liveliness of, exactly. of a yeah. debate that's happening between people. Exactly, yeah. So it's more, then it becomes these very tiny shifts of meaning that you can at least follow sure. in a written sure. form. And then once you follow them, there are the, the nuggets of kind of clear exposition that come in between that kind of pull you back from the brink. Can I, can I, I, I have a question from oh, Curtis? Sorry. Can I just jump in because it relates a question from the audience about uh, uh, yesterday there seemed to be a suspicion that if a translation was smooth, it might be inaccurate. So in that sort of process that all of you go through of, of uh, um, where, do you, where do you stop? When, the English, when is the English good enough? When is it readable enough? When is it pretty enough? Uh, or is it, can, is it, is it possible that it's too pretty and it should be? Yeah. I, I think it's a very, very subjective hmm. um, point because, um, I mean, there are many other external factors. You know, you have a deadline. Mm -hmm. The publisher has already <laughs> announced your book. You know, I mean, there, there are many other factors. Um, you know, I mean, I can put it out this way. Um, I don't know for others. But for me, I'm never 100% satisfied with any translation that I've done. So there, I can always see a room for improvement. But then on the other hand... After it's published, when you yeah, see it in yeah, print. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, but, and I have been accused, you know, believe it or not, of being too much on the taking the liberty side. Um, so, and, and in fact, yesterday, this came through in um, Dawn and, uh, the day before yesterday, Dawn and our discussion, that I would send, so we, we split up the chapters, we would translate, and he would send his to me, and I would work on them using track changes, and I would send mine to Dawn, and Dawn would, you know, almost, in many cases, would try to re, re, <laughs> re institute the kind of more natural syntax of the Tibetan to be closer um, so I, you know, it, it seems I do take greater liberty. Um, so I've been accused um, by some, fortunately very small uh, you know, minority. I, I think, you know, I, I think it depends on the text. You know, I mean, if it's a philosophical text, you want to get it right in terms of accuracy, reference, concepts, the clarity of the concept, the argument. If it is a biography, you want the descriptive side to be very accurate so that there is a kind of a visual image that can be given to the person. Um, if it is a poetic literature, then the evocation of certain types of experience, like you were bringing out the various examples, as you can see, depending on which version you choose, it changes your response mm -hmm. to the poem. And you know, the fact that the author chooses to write in a particular poem, like experiential songs, they are called guru. They are supposed to be like folk songs. They are supposed to be spontaneously written. And we need to bring that spontaneity. The guru does not, guru uses very, rare, very rarely uh, caviar resources because caviar brings a certain element of, you know, contrivance. Mm -hmm. 
It's a kind of, you know, it's like a high, high poetry. So guru is generally tends to be much closer to the kind of rhythm and the language of the vernacular songs. Um, and in fact, the rhythm, if you look at the guru's rhythm, is very different from the normal liturgical text rhythm. So you have, you know, liturgical text rhythm goes most of the time, you know, nine syllables. Now here you have a different rhythm. And this rhythm is much closer to Tibetan folk songs. And it's to con convey that. And, you know, those are the things that, you know, really determine what kind of smoothness mm. you would expect in English. Mm. At least that's how I approach right. the challenge. Yeah. Janet, could, would you say something about that? Your, your Jigme Lingpo book, it reads so beautifully. It's so melodic and yet well, so Well, thank you. I, that's, one, that's, a, that's an example of now yeah. that I read that translation, I find it so clunky and awkward. Even though I worked with a poet friend who edited, but it could have been because I, you know, I do think that, it's, that one should try to capture the aesthetics and somehow reproduce, even though in some cases it's really very sure. hard. Sure. But to reproduce the aesthetics and the rhetoric of the text, the the, the original, and and um, and you know, I mean, the question of where do you stop? I, you know, it's true. It's when the deadline is, or you're just thinking, okay, this is crazy. You know, I just have to stop. You know, <laughs> but you do, you know, one does work very sure. hard on it. Sure. I ju I want to raise a, a kind of related question. So one thing that I noted, again, Jim Jimala, you were saying today, and you said also the first e evening that something about English being so much richer and so much more evocative. But we had also a discussion yesterday where some people were talking about English is fundamentally dualistic and Tibetan is not. And, and I think that that kind of, I, I think, so it's striking that people can come down on both sides and oh. all, often the grass looks greener on the other. <laughs> side of the fence, but I, I'm a firm believer that translation is possible. It is, yeah. And, yeah. and I definitely don't, I think you can write non-dualistically in English as well as you can in Tibetan. That's just, a, I, I'm, whoever it was that said that, we can argue about it later, but I, I don't think that's true. <laughs> well, I, uh, and, and you can leave out the, the, the subject or the pronouns in English and it's fine. I mean, I, uh, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, one of the things that I really believe in is the Ralph Emerson statement that any sentiment or insight into human experience in one language, articulated in one language, should be translatable in another language. And I, I genuinely believe this. Um, you know, how exactly is a different question. Uh, but having said that, um, you know, there's a reason why Tibet never had a novel writing tradition. It's, it's what? Novel writing tradition. We had only one novel written in the 19th century, 17th, 18th century. Uh, so novel writing. And Tibetans, um, you know, because the, even the biographies are written in a very devotional form. So kind of very psychologically oriented type of biography. Even in the West, it's a fairly, fairly modern phenomenon. And that brings a richness in the way in which you describe create a character. And if you look at the Tibetan stories, the character development is pretty thin. You know, so there are strengths. Um, but when it comes to describing the subtleties of Madhyamaka thought or complexities of Pramana debate or philosophy of language, then, you know, in English we are struggling because we're using, the throwing the Sanskrit right? terms. Yeah. So I think that's what I mean. So there are and there's also a reason why, if you look at the English, Oxford English Dictionary, the number of words in English well, is far true. more. Well, Tibet was a relatively Tibet. isolated place, sure, even sure. though people are moving through. English today, you know, it's so multicultural exactly. and yeah. we've absorbed. Yeah. So it's about its history. Yeah. But and I'm then not my... sure that it's about its grammatical structure or its syntax per se. That's what I guess what I'm saying. Mm. Certainly, an issue of vocabulary is one thing. Another oh. is the sort of grammatical structure of the language. Yes, I think those are two different things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. I'm going to jump in with a few questions. Sorry. Um, so, so all of you have spoken about, I mean, Jimpa, you're sort of in a special situation, but all of you have spoken about working with uh, a native Tibetan speaker and a Tibetan expert. Um, and so uh, uh, Sanjay Khandro is, is, thanks Janet uh, for, for raising that issue again, because I think uh, it's, it's a very important a part of the translation process and the translation, how it's how it's happened in the West, and and, uh, and so uh, here's a great question of uh, does anyone in working with um, Tibetan poetry does anyone work with poets? <laughs> 
Well, I'm working with Pim Pim Pum. Pum. Yeah. Right. yeah, he right. can. But what, uh, what about an English language poet? You mean like in, doing in, your, translation? in your translation, would you? Yeah, then... I did that. I, oh. That's what I did with Jigme Lingpa's okay. Namtar, is I gave it to a Western poet guy right. who, who right. did make it more poetic. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah, I think you can do that. And, you know, you know, obviously there's constraints of how far you want to go and how much of the original metaphor you want to maintain and, and, and so on and so forth. But it's, so that's, that's the thing about polishing. You know, you go over a thing a hundred times, like your, your example showed, and you can always come up with a new way of putting it, and you can always, sure. you know, make it better. And the more you're able to do that, and especially with people who have a good ear mm -hmm. for English, the, mm -hmm. the better. Mm -hmm. You know, why not? Curtis, um, you Yeah, I haven't done that so much with poetry. I mean, I haven't worked with poets, but for um, prose, when I translated the um, 10th J. Kempo's Life of the Buddha, I, I sat down with English language books that I loved and it's just amazing. analyzed, w w tried to analyze a little bit more than I had previously uh -huh. why those sentences were effective to me. Why, um, why uh, the construction of uh, direct speech was impactful for me? Mm -hmm. I mean, at that point, it was it was actually Cormac McCarthy that I that, that I that I just I sat down. And I said I remembered reading um, Blood Meridian and just you know I mean, being blown away. Right? Um, not not by the you know the topic is terrifying and probably sometimes very objectionable, but the language is just gorgeous and. I wanted to know why that was the case, and so I worked through that a little bit. So that's not working with a live person, but it's working with a living tradition of literature, which is not immediately connected to right, a life of the Buddha. Right. Yeah. 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 And then a few practical questions about, uh, about um, uh, lexicons and standard translations, and uh, you know, it seems Tibetans were very concerned with that, right? about getting the Sanskrit just right and then having consistency. Um, you mentioned earlier it's too early uh, to to uh, to establish that, uh, but but obviously um, Jeffrey Hopkins is is famous for that. Uh, what's what's all of your uh, your senses of that? Is there is there a need for a standard um, English translation of, of every term? Is it too early? Holding is it the bag. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't think we're ever going to get there. There's too much richness, too many ideas. Um, that's why I'm really happy to see it across at least one chunk of literature, because that helps a lot to see that. I, I've also been happy as I pick up, you know, because I sort of wasn't really looking, keeping up with what was coming out, and I'll pick up books now and I'll say, oh good, it looks like that term's kind of settled. Mm -hmm. And then it's just easier, you know, and if we kind of get beyond the controversial ones and, and hopefully things will settle more. But I also think um, I'm a big one on kind of getting beyond translation at some point and talking about things in English from the start. Mm. And I, I saw in Mathieu Ricard's book on happiness, there's some one, I've forgotten them. I, I wasn't thinking about this talk when I, when I went through that book quickly, but he's got some wonderful terms that aren't translation terms, but they're perfect. And it's like, that's when we kind of open up to the richness of English and free ourselves from the shackles of, you know, consistent vocabulary, that I think that's where there's, where I really like to see the sort of the future going. Yeah, I think that there is, there are certain terms that are really technical terms, and especially, you know, Jeffrey Hopkins was working with a very particular literature, and where the terms are indeed defined in very technical way, and there's an attempt at consistency. But now that we've understood that Tibetan is not only about that kind of literature, but Tibetan has, you know, and I'm not the thing about the novel, but I do think that the biographical tradition in Tibet is pretty creative, and the poetic tradition. And in that case, you know, God forbid that, you know, like uh, Luis Gomez's uh, talk yesterday definitely made the point that you don't want to have a standard translation for certain terms because in different contexts they're yes. used in different ways. So, you, you know, you don't, you certainly don't want to have that kind of right. situation. That would just deaden the whole mm. thing. Mm. In my own approach um, for the classic series, um, I'm actually a big Wittgensteinian on this um, you know, the, his, his statement that meaning of a word is its use. Mm. 
Um, I, I think that's something that we should keep in mind. And one of the things that I request the translators, although we don't impose a uniformity across the series, what we do expect a uniformity within one volume if there are multiple texts. Uh, even that is sometimes a problem uh, because it's a matter of the two translators or three translators negotiating among themselves and sometimes me having to adjudicate or get involved. Um, but one thing that I do request is when there are established phrases and terms, please do use them. Mm -hmm. you know, thanks to Edward Conte's work, and he dedicated his life, later part of his life, for translating the Prajnaparamita Sutras. And perfection of wisdom is a very established phrase. And uh, in, in, if we don't use it, calling it perfection of transcendent inside, whatever it is, <laughs> It creates more headache. Mm. So th those are things I, and then emptiness, not the void, not voidness, please, emptiness. <laughs> you know, there might be a problem with it, but still <laughs> it's used. Mm. So those things that I, um, you know, the, those things that have become like dependent origination, not codependent arising. <laughs> like yesterday, someone talked about the codependency uh, issue. Was it Jonathan Gold? <laughs> yeah, that was great. Yeah, because that was over reading mm. uh, of, 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 of uh, De Virtua. And in fact, if you look at the actual philosophical explanation, some of the Buddhist masters took great pains to explain that the dependent and arising are not sequential. They are actually simultaneous. It's not that things come into dependence first and then arise afterwards. Dependently arise. So it's a way in which they arise is dependently arising. So it's, they took are great pains. suggesting a new term? No, no, no. I'm, I'm suggesting that no, uh -huh. people are using codependent. That's the problem. Oh, I see. So instead of saying codependence, because codependent presupposes two or mm. things, whereas you, are, you, you won't be able to say that, that attribute to in a single event. I see. Yeah, so those kind of things you know, people are using either dependent arising or dependent origination. So that's more established. So that I request. And hopefully more and more of these will, you know, build up. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should have the OED type committee so that those that are established gets into a kind of a Buddhist lexicon. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And then as for the others, we will see. Um, but one thing that I do request um, the, the series of uh, translators is, as much as possible, avoid keeping Sanskrit terms. So, you know, poetry is a little different. When there are verses, sometimes it's better to use Dhammakaya, so we give an exception. But otherwise, uh, and we have no Wiley in the main body of the text because it's just so off-putting, yes. you know. Uh, and so no Wiley in the main body of the text, in the footnotes, yes. So those kind of conventions we have, you know, kind of adopted. So mm -hmm. that, um, but standardization of all the terms, I'm not so sure. Folks, even like, I mean, like Louise pointed out about the problem of chitta, and in Tibetan we use the word Tremper, which is problematic. Sometimes it is mindfulness, sometimes it's recollection, sometimes it just means awareness. Mm -hmm. You know, attenje teme, you know, at the point of death, whether the person is, con you know, awareness or not. Mm -hmm. And then similarly, gom, you know, whenever you, use, you have the word gom, some, some people use meditation. It's not really. I mean, you know, when you say meditation, ningji gomba, you cannot say meditation on compassion then compassion becomes the object. You, you are engaging in a meditation practice that involves cultivating compassion. So sometimes gom has to be used as cultivate or practice or imagine or visualize. Mm. So it has to be used contextually. Mm. So I think these are issues that really need to be thought through more carefully mm. before trying to impose a kind of mm. standard terminology. But it came up in one of the group sessions yesterday that you know, what do people want to see? And, and so many of us who, who are translators, as this is unfolding, really like to look through the English and see the Tibetan behind it. And which just, it's sort of inspiring sure. the trust sure. in translations. And consistent terminology is just critical mm -hmm. to that. Oh, I see. Oh, oh, again, sorry. Marley, yeah. Okay. I was gonna say, it's never gonna happen in this society, right, in this world. That, that level of uniformity, but it's so powerful we should try, huh? Right? Just, I mean, we're so, we're so multiple now that um, uh, even if one group were to achieve some sort of uniformity, 
84,000, uh, right? One of the big, big, big projects. I'd love to hear more about some people who are managing those projects, as you've just spoken about with yours. Um, but there's so much power, right? I mean, you just look back to one, you can note the difference between um, ninth century Tibet and today, right? And say that's never going to happen again, <laughs> right? In the history of the earth, right? Unless really bad things happen to us, right? Because it's an extremely small society, right? And there was, there was deep central control, right? That made that translation process happen. But look at what it did, right? All of that, all of that uniformity jump-started one of the most amazing indigenous literary traditions in the world, right? And, then, and it came, almost came through like a funnel, right, of straight-jacketed translations over hundreds of thousands of pages, right? And they could never have predicted that it would happen, right? 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 The, you, in the ninth century, you couldn't have predicted that the 12th century happened in Tibetan literature. But much of it was because they, they had that level of control and they had that level of uniformity. And that might be useful for us. I'm going to jump in with another uh, question from the audience. This is a really uh, interesting point, and it, it, it uh, reminds me of uh, Susan's uh, uh, talk yesterday about, or she mentioned yesterday about the issue of translating Sanskrit, or I'm um, sorry, Shakespeare into uh, contemporary English. So uh, this, a, a person from the audience wrote, the use, of, uh, the use by Tibetans of English translations is troubling. Uh, this suggests that the contact between Tibetans and the classical literature might be lost. Have Tibetans thought of modernizing the classical language and updating the classical uh, uh, traditions? I mean, is there, is there a sense maybe that uh, if, if Tibetans start reading English and not reading uh, a, a dead language, essentially, right? Is there, is there any interest in, in uh, translating classical Tibetan into modern Tibetan? Has anyone ever heard of such a thing? I mean, is that... Uh, um, I think that's... Um, no, I actually... That, Tibet has never been a fully literate society until very recently. Um, you know, the, the texts were read by the monastic community and the educated elite, and the mainstream community, the larger secular uh, community, never really read. And so that's why there's a very rich oral tradition of sayings and stories and so on in, 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 in Tibet. Um, so the young, younger generation of Tibetans reading Dharma books in English, I don't think would be a source of concern, shouldn't be a source of concern. If anything, actually, having the translation of English will help them read the Tibetan, uh, because the, the gap between the spoken and the written Tibetan is still quite big. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, the, the idea of modern Tibetan is a bit of a, um, a strange concept, because we don't, I mean, we have only one written language. There's no modern literature in the form in which a different kind of Tibetan is being used. And I, for one, as someone who loves the classical tradition, would be appalled if there comes a time <laughs> you know, when we will be redoing them in a kind of a more vernacular Tibetan. Hmm. I don't think that's the way to go. The way to go is to raise the level of education of the Tibetan so that their appreciation of the classical text I mean, one thing that I would hope at some point, and it may still be, it may still sound very outrageous, and if it is, I would apologize to the venerables who are here. Um, I would love to see, at some point, um, a writing on Dharma that, done by lamas now, using some of the conventions taken from modern languages, which has a very clear-cut punctuations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the Chinese are doing it. Chinese are using the quotation marks, full stops, and commas, and so on. And if you look at Chinese newspapers, and they're using it. And that makes the reading so easy, because human brain is designed to digest information only in chunks, small chunks. And when you read an English book, you see a full stop. The brain completely ignores what's coming next. And there's a way in which you can immediately manage in a digestible piece, information in front of you. And I know, talking to a lot of Tibetan, Western scholars who are working on Tibetan texts, the punctuation is the biggest headache. Yeah. Where do you chop it? Because their sentences go on and on and on. There is no punctuation mark other than one she. <laughs> so this is one, and, and I actually wrote a modern grammar, um, which was, you know, my argument was to, we can keep the classical Tibetan as it is, the written but we need a new way of 
conceptually understanding it and introduce punctuation. So I, in fact, suggested, you know this Renjian Pungxie with the three dots and a line? It's got no use because in the old days when there was an orphan syllable, it was being used. Now there is no concept of orphan syllable because if you are using computer, orphan syllable can be anywhere. So I've suggested that why don't we use that as a full stop? So at least we have one full stop. And in my grammar book, I use that throughout my book as a full stop. And let alone others, but even some of my students were horrified. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I just want to point this is quite amazing that, that Tubman Jumala wrote a whole a new Tibetan grammar. It's quite a controversial thing, and this thing has been circulated um, amongst Tibetans both inside China and in exile. And there's a, there's there this is a very huge conversation that's going it on is, amongst yeah. Tibetan yeah. intellectuals. A very lively world, and how the Tibetan language is changing, and it has to change, and it yeah. will change. Sure. I just do want to point out this is not an argument for not changing, and not an argument against you, but there is some kind of mentality, like the people who are able to maintain a sentence, you know, for a line after, there's something about a mindfulness and a certain kind of mental yeah, state yeah. and acuity that's necessary to remember all these, like, you know, you know uh, adjectives and all these other things. And, and so it's very different when you true, chop it up. True. My own technique in translating, the one thing that, I, that I've taken liberty on a lot, and I, it's very helpful, is just simply breaking down bigger sentences into shorter sen sentences, yeah. that it does help sure. comprehension, at least for us now with our, mm -hmm. with, with our mindset, but it's, it's different. Mm. I'm not sure I remember everything in the question, but I remember it being really interesting. <laughs> the question was about uh, Tibetans Talk reading. Talk about memory. Yeah. Young, Tibetans, know, terrible, huh? yeah. young Tibetans reading Dharma in English. Yeah, OK. Wouldn't okay, that, okay. yeah. And should that be translated into modern Tibetan? Yeah, OK. So I mean, trans. Well, vernacularization yeah. is already happening, right? I mean, it's been happening since the 80s at least, right? Dun Rupkel translates Dunhuang poetry into vernacular contemporary verse, roughly yeah. speaking, right? And you could say that it's always been happening. Um, I mean, one example I can think of off the top of my head is the, this um, prose version of um, the Bodhisattva Avadana Kapalata that, um, I can't remember the dude's name, Pema Chopel or something. It's the one that's translated by Dharma Publishing. That's not the actual Bodhisattva uh, of it on a couple of times, right? That's a, but it's a that's modern a it's a version. No, it was an 18th century one, right? But it's a vernacular right. version of it, and it's a constant process, right? And it's not a one-way process. It's a, right. it's a, it's a, it's a bellows, or, right? It's it's a it's a flexible and creative process. But the, I mean, in translation of literature from other places has been an, an essential part of that in <laughs> in the birth of modern Tibetan literature, and has played an incredible role in this. Um, uh, uh, very fierce debates about tradition versus innovation, uh, right? I mean, that's life of modern Tibetan literature. Um, and it's continuing to happen. Someone in this room is translating, I was blown away, Kerouac's On the Road into Tibetan. And at first I thought, oh my gosh, that's going to be so hard. And I thought, no, this is the perfect language to translate that. It's a book. Yeah? It might be better in Tibetan than it is in English. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Well, I, I think we should stop. And uh, thank you so much to uh, our four speakers. <laughs>